Jules Benjamin, uh, Media Benjamin. Welcome to Berlin. Uh, let me start from the very beginning about what is a drone, because it is simply something that flies in the air, that has a camera on it, and that can be controlled remotely. I don't know if any of you have seen some of these small drones that you can buy in the stores. Uh, I have one. Uh, we often take it to the homes of uh, the heads of drone manufacturers and fly it over their houses to see how they like it. Um, but uh, there was a lot of media attention recently to the interview that the head of Amazon, the company Amazon gave, uh, when he said that in a couple of years they would be delivering packages to people by drone. Anybody yeah. see that news piece? Um, and they even had a little video that they showed of the uh, package being put into a plastic box that was then picked up by a small drone and carried out uh, into the air and dropped at the doorstep of the person who purchased the um, item. And uh, the American people, I think, for the first time, started realizing that in the future, there will probably be many different uses of drones. Already there are some drones that are being used for humanitarian purposes, like... Um, tracking endangered species, or uh, delivering goods in places after an earthquake, or uh, fighting forest fires. So in my opinion, the problem is not the technology, the problem is how it's being used. And I will focus this evening on the negative uses of drones, and that is for killing and for spying. Uh, in the U.S., the drones have been researched now for decades, going way back to World War I, uh, World War II, um, used uh, uh, crudely in uh, the Vietnam War. But it was only in the 80s, the 1980s, and the 90s, with the development of GPS and satellite technology and the sophistication of the equipment that um, there became a real possibility of using drones uh, in a more comprehensive way. Uh, the U.S. has been working very closely with the Israeli military decades now uh, because the Israeli technology was the most developed technology and uh, but it wasn't until the 9-11 attacks that drones really came into their own. Uh, at the time of 9-11, the defense ministry only had 50 drones in its arsenal. Uh, today it has over 10,000. Many of these are small drones that can be put in the soldier's backpack and launched in the field. Uh, some of them are the killer, the reaper, and predator drones that are the size of a small commercial, uh, a small airplane. And some of them are the large, uh, the largest is the global hawk that you all have some experience with, if not in flight, in taking a lot of your taxpayer money and dumping it down a big hole. Uh, which is the whole of the profits of the companies that make these. But um, the majority of the drones uh, started to be used in Afghanistan and in Iraq in the more open declared wars. But as uh, Thomas said in his introduction, it really became the weapon of choice of the Obama administration for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's ironic that Obama campaigned to stop the worst excesses of the Bush administration, to close down Guantanamo, stop torture, 
stop extraordinary rendition where people would be picked up and flown to places uh, where they would be tortured. Uh, and because he had campaigned to close Guantanamo, when he became elected, uh, he realized that it would be very hypocritical if he would capture people in places like Pakistan and bring them to Guantanamo. So they got together with their lawyers and looked at the options and decided that a better option for them would be to simply kill them. Obama says that his policy of his government is to capture people first as a first option. But that is not true. The first option has been to kill them by drones. Uh, the other reason is that the American people started complaining about the wars, the cost of war at a time of financial crisis, the American lives that were being killed, being lost in Afghanistan and Iraq. And this weapon seemed like a solution that it would stop risking, directly risking, the lives of US personnel without any pilot in the cockpit. Uh, it was cheaper, certainly, than sending 100,000 troops into Afghanistan at a cost of $1 million per soldier. But there was another advantage, and that is that this was a program that was put into the hands of the most covert, the most secretive agencies in the United States, the CIA and the military's Joint Special Operations Command, and it allowed the Obama administration to carry on with wars in new places behind the backs of the American people. It is the most undemocratic way of waging war because it means he didn't even go to Congress to get permission. It is simply using executive power and covert agencies. So one question is, who determines who will be targeted and how? Well, this is something coming directly from the White House itself. We learned in an expose in the New York Times that the Obama administration calls together their advisors into the White House every Tuesday. They actually called it Terror Tuesdays and would set up a list a hit list, like a mafia hit list. These are the people we want to take out with their names and their pictures. It is quite remarkable to think that President Obama, as a constitutional lawyer, thinks that he has the right to play the role of prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner all at once by coming up with a kill list. But there's something that's even worse, and that is he has given these covert entities the authority to kill people simply on the basis of suspicious behavior. These are called signature strikes. And uh, the administration defined any male of military age that lives in the areas where we are using these drones is a militant. So imagine the authority that's given to a CIA official to say, oh, it looks like from my vantage point uh, 8,000 miles away that these people are engaged in militant activity. I think I'll send in the drones. So many of the uh, people in the United States would like to know some basic issues. How many people have been killed? How many of them are civilians? How many of them are militants? I wish we had answers to these questions, but our government has refused to give us the answers. There is a US senator on the Intelligence Committee, uh, Lindsey Graham, 
a, a very conservative Southerner, one day in an interview blurted out that there had been 4,700 people killed uh, by drones. This was the first time a figure like that was put forward. In fact, from the Obama administration, uh, in 2011, the person who was the mastermind of the uh, drone program, John Brennan, said that there were zero civilian casualties and later revised it to say only a handful. But from independent journalists and think tanks that have been tracking this, our best estimates are that there have been perhaps 3,800 people killed in just Pakistan and Yemen and Somalia, that of those, there have been uh, hundreds of them civilians. In fact, 200 children have been named in Pakistan alone. And of the thousands of people who have been killed, only 2% of them were on that kill list the kill list of the high-value al-Qaeda targets. So who are the other thousands of people that have been killed? They have either been low-level Taliban, low-level al-Qaeda, or they have been innocent people. Uh, I had a chance to travel to both uh, Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan and Yemen. In the case of Afghanistan, we were first given numbers, the military is in charge of the drone program in Afghanistan. And first they've started putting numbers up on their website of how many drone attacks there have been. When we realized that there was a tremendous increase in drone attacks in the last year when the US is supposedly winding down the war in Afghanistan, they took the figures off of the website. So you can no longer get that information. In the case of Pakistan, it seems, as Tomas said, there have been about 380 drone strikes, the vast majority, as you said, under the Obama administration. And we have met with family members whose loved ones had been killed in these drone strikes. One family we helped to bring to the United States for the first time since the U.S. started to use drones in 2002, it was the first time we ever managed to get visas for a drone victim family to come to the United States. And in this case, it was a very tragic story of a grandmother who had been out in the fields picking okra with her grandchildren when suddenly, from nowhere, a drone came and dropped a missile, uh, basically disintegrating the body of the grandmother. They said there were only pieces of flesh that were lying around. And the shrapnel uh, wounded the, the grandchildren. Uh, it was a very, um, uh, it was such a sad story that when they came to the United States, and told this in front of some of the members of Congress. Uh, I looked out, and the translator was crying as she told the story. There were people in the audience who were crying, and there were actually Congress people who were crying when they heard the story. Uh, it is amazing it took 10 years for these kind of stories to be told in the United States. Uh, when we went to Pakistan, we heard story after story. But the other thing we heard is it's not just the people who are killed and wounded. It's also the populations that are terrorized by the sound of the drone that is constantly buzzing overhead and the knowledge that the drone is going to drop a missile, but they don't know when, they don't know where, they don't know who will be targeted. This is something that we were told, and this is something that is documented by two very prestigious US law schools, one in Stanford and one in uh, New York, uh, that uh, came out with a booklet called Living Under Drones. 
and I've incorporated their findings into my book because I thought it was so important for people to understand um, the way these drones are affecting communities where parents are afraid to send their children to school because schools have been hit. Uh, people are afraid to go to the marketplace because markets have been hit. They're afraid to gather in communal settings like weddings and funerals because they have been hit. Um, it destroys the very fabric of the community. Children have become traumatized. There's a lot of depression, of bedwetting. Uh, and um, one of the women we met said, in my province, there are 250,000 people. The U.S. is terrorizing 250,000 people to get one or two people. In your war, or in our U.S. war on terrorism, she said, you are terrorizing us. So in the case of Pakistan, we see tremendous protests against the U.S. drones. The Pakistani people have said, we hate the Taliban, we hate Al-Qaeda, and we hate the U.S. drones. We're caught between the two of them. And the, uh, the protests have become huge. Uh, uh, Tomas talked about the November 1st drone strike that killed one of the Taliban leaders right before negotiations were supposed to start. As a result of that, um, there have been blockades now of a U.S. base in Pakistan to try to uh, force the U.S. to stop the drone strikes. We know from WikiLeaks that in the past, the Pakistani government has been working with the U.S. government to target uh, and support the drone strikes while telling their population that they were against it. Now that has changed. The Pakistani government is no longer working with the U.S. on this. There have been democratic elections, new people in power, and they have very clearly stated, as has the legislature voted, they want no more U.S. drone strikes. They say they are counterproductive, they only support extremists, they've become a tool for recruiting extremists, and they want them to stop. But the U.S. has not listened. And in fact, what the U.S. has done is begin a similar program in Yemen. And that started under Obama in 2009 because they said Al-Qaeda has moved from Afghanistan to Pakistan to Yemen. When the U.S. Uh, started the drone strikes there in 2009, there were maybe 200 people who were part of extremist groups. Today, after the drone strikes, there are over a thousand. And once again, we hear the people in Yemen saying, this is a recruiting tool for Al-Qaeda. We met with a, a man who uh, we also brought to the United States recently. And he told the story of his brother, who was a, a very outspoken cleric, who s preached against Al-Qaeda. He said Al-Qaeda did not have respect for human lives. Al-Qaeda was um, distorting uh, the essence of, uh, uh, of Islam. And uh, because he had preached against Al-Qaeda, his family was worried for his life, worried that Al-Qaeda was going to kill him. Well, he was asked to come to a meeting and, uh, by two people who were in Al-Qaeda. He was very worried that they would try to kill him. So he brought along his young nephew, who is a policeman, for his protection. And there they are, sitting in this meeting, uh, not uh, in, in the end uh, getting killed by Al-Qaeda, but getting killed by a U.S. drone. Uh, we also met with a, a man whose brother was a taxi driver. And you know, when you are driving a taxi, you pick up strangers. So he picked up strangers. Uh, they were driving along, and 10 minutes later, 
the car was uh, blown up by a missile fired by a U.S. drone. Uh, the, the brother was killed, uh, and um, this man that we met, Mohammed Al-Gawi, a very proud tribal uh, member, he said to us that in his tribal customs, if somebody commits a horrible crime or a terrible mistake, they have to do something about it. They have to acknowledge what they did, they have to apologize to the family, and they have to compensate the family for their loss. He said the United States has refused to do any of that, even acknowledge what they did. He said, could it be that my tribal culture is more evolved when it comes to justice than the United States of America? And he has written to President Obama asking precisely for acknowledgement, apology, and compensation. Uh, he has not gotten any reply. In fact, the reply is that they refuse to give him a visa to come to the United States. So we have the situation in Yemen where the drones are uh, actively recruiting new uh, members to Al-Qaeda. And um, we have drones that are being used in Somalia. They were used in Libya. They have been used in the Philippines. And if you want to get a sense of where the U.S. thinks it is going with the drone warfare, just look at where the bases are being opened up. And there are bases now that are throughout the Middle East in places like Qatar, uh, Oman, the Emirates, and Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia is of particular concern to me, and I think should be to all Americans, because if you recall, one of the reasons Osama bin Laden said he hated the United States was because we had bases in the Holy Lands in Saudi Arabia. Well, one of the actual positive things that George Bush did was to close those bases in Saudi Arabia in 2003. Comes Obama administration in 2010, they reopened a base in Saudi Arabia now for the drones. To me, this is a national security danger. To me, this is inviting blowback. If you look at other places where drone bases have been o opened, they are throughout Africa. Uh, in the tiny island nation, uh, the, 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 the island nation of the Seychelles, in the tiny country of Djibouti, in Ethiopia, uh, now in West Africa like Niger. And uh, this is of great concern because it indicates that the U.S. is not only using surveillance drones, but potentially will be doing more lethal drones in Africa. And this should be of particular concern to Germans because Germany is directly implicated in this. One, by having the uh, headquarters of AFRICOM based in Stuttgart, which is helping to uh, target areas in Africa, and then at the base in Ramstein, where this is a center for so much U.S. military activity from the time of uh, Vietnam and Afghanistan, with thousands of Americans working there, both military and civilians. This has become a center in the drone war, uh, where thanks to investigative reporting that has been done in your media, it's called uh, Süd Süddeutsche Zeitung. Süddeutsche. Um, Germans are becoming aware that you have a, a, a satellite relay station here that is helping the United States uh, in its uh, communications and its targeting. So I hope in a discussion we can talk a little bit more about uh, how we can raise the voices of Germans uh, against the collaboration of uh, Germany with this U.S. program, which, let's face it, is a program of murder. Um, the... Uh, 
other thing of, of great concern is that right now it's just the United States, um, the UK, and Israel that have used armed drones. But there is a arms race in drones, and there are now 87 countries by the last count that have some sort of drone. And I'm not talking about the tiny little ones. Uh, some of them are the bigger, like the Predator drones. Uh, most of them being used for surveillance, but there's about 10 to 15 countries that are in the process of weaponizing those drones, including China and Iran. Uh, the biggest exporter of drones is not the United States, it is Israel. And Israel has used the drones systematically uh, for surveillance in uh, 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 Gaza, but also for killing people in Gaza. In fact, in its sales pitch, uh, Israel brags about how they are constantly battle testing the drones and improving the technology. Uh, the U.S. is number two exporter. There are still some limits on where the U.S. can export drones, but there is a very strong lobby in the United States that is trying to lift those restrictions. And then there is the country that sees a market and says we will produce things faster and cheaper, and that is China. And indeed, China is producing lots of drones uh, very inexpensive drones, and selling them all over the world. So this should be of grave concern uh, to everybody that um, the, uh, the model that the U.S. has set forth of being able to go anywhere around the world, kill anyone they like, uh, on the basis of secret information is something that other countries can start to do, as well as non-state entities, because uh, Iran has given drones to Hezbollah, and uh, this technology will start getting out into the hands of uh, non-state groups as well. While the drone lobby uh, is busy trying to sell its weapons overseas, it is also trying to sell drones in the United States. Uh, it sees the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan winding down and needs more markets. And one of the markets they are very keen to open up is the U.S. market in terms of selling to police stations. There are 18,000 police stations in the United States. They would love to sell to all of those. Now, right now, the U.S. airspace is controlled by the Federal Aviation Administration, and they recognize that the drones are in their still early stages of technology and that they are not safe. They crash all the time. And it is one thing to have drones crash in the ocean or in the mountains of Tora Bora uh, or in poor places overseas, uh, but the uh, U.S. agency does not want them crashing in residential neighborhoods in the United States. So they have wanted to go slowly in opening up the airspace, but the drone lobby is very powerful and has passed legislation in the United States that says by September 2015, U.S. airspace will be opened up to drones. So as I mentioned, we might have packages, messenger services being delivered by drones, but of great concern is drones in the hands of police agencies, FBI, uh, other government agencies. I don't think I have to convince you in Germany that we already have a surveillance state in the United States that has overreached, including tapping the phones of your own chancellor here. Um, we are an over-surveilled society already. And if indeed we allow our police agencies and FBI to be using drones in the United States, like the Global Hawk that is capable of watching an entire city at one time, 
we will turn into a 24-7 surveillance society which will profoundly change the nature of public life in the United States. Fortunately, there is a backlash against this before it even proliferates in internally. There are a few dozen police stations that have gotten uh, experimental permits to try out these drones. Uh, one of them is in Seattle. I don't know if you know Seattle, but it's actually a very liberal city in the United States. The people of Seattle had no idea their police department had bought two drones. Uh, and when they heard about it, they were furious. And they demanded a meeting with the mayor and the police chief. And at that meeting, there was such an outcry against the use of drones that the mayor had to apologize to the people and return the drones. That's the kind of example we want to see throughout the United States. Um, there are other examples that are maybe not so nonviolent. For example, a small town in Colorado uh, is putting on the ballot a measure that says uh, that um, anybody who manages to shoot down a drone would get a reward from the city. <laughs> uh, so there is a, a healthy um, opposition that is not ideological. It's not left or right. It really goes from libertarian to very progressive and alliances that are being formed uh, to regulate the use of drones and say that you can't use drones for law enforcement without having a court order. Uh, so we are trying to combine in the United States opposition to drones for spying with opposition for drones for killing. We're trying to tell Americans that it is a, a slippery slope if you start out allowing drones to be used for uh, surveillance, they will start weaponizing those drones. And in fact, this is something that was told to us uh, by uh, a person we met in, uh, in, in Yemen, uh, the person whose brother had been killed, he said, right now, we feel like we are your guinea pigs. You are testing out your technology on us, just like the Israelis are testing out the technology on the Palestinians. But he said, don't be so complacent. You might not be concerned about killing poor Muslim people thousands of miles away, but this technology will come back to haunt you in the United States. And I think he was very uh, uh, profound in that statement. So we are building up a movement in the US to oppose the drones. Uh, we now have protests happening at the bases in the US where the drones are being piloted but killing people thousands of miles away. We have protests at the headquarters of the CIA, the Pentagon, the White House, uh, the offices of the Congress people who won't do anything about this. There is a uh, well-organized campaign against the next uh, 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 technological um, development in drones, which would be autonomous drones, drones that don't even have any pilot. They are pre-programmed to go out and kill. Uh, there are uh, campaigns to uh, educate the American people. That's why I wrote the book. I've been traveling around to hundreds of US cities trying to uh, mobilize, organize people, university students to stop the research that their uh, engineering departments are doing on drones. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, we held a drone summit in the United States where we got hundreds of people together from around the U.S. We even had uh, international visitors like uh, Elsa, who is here uh, from Germany. And we created a net U.S. network that we want to then expand to be a global network. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I'm here. We're having a meeting uh, on, uh, with representatives from eight different countries to look at how we can work together, uh, how we can mobilize our efforts uh, to be stronger opposition. I feel we have had some success in the United States already. Those of you who know the US 
uh, know that for the last few decades, um, it has been seen to be, uh, it, it, we are um, a very militaristic society. And after 9-11, even more so. Uh, the U.S. population was very much in favor of attacking Afghanistan, was also in favor of attacking Iraq. Uh, the mood in the United States has shifted tremendously after a decade. The American people, some people use the term war-weary. I use the term war-wise because I think Americans have become wise to the fact that after a decade of war, uh, they have drained our resources, contributed to the financial crisis with trillions of dollars being spent on these wars, that thousands of our soldiers have died for nothing, that the people uh, of Afghanistan and Iraq are no better off for our presence there. And um, this uh, opposition to war was then seen very clearly when President Obama wanted to take us into another war in the case of Syria. And I have never in my life seen a spontaneous outcry from the American people to say no. It was really a beautiful sight to behold uh, of people left and right and Democrats and Republicans all standing up against Obama uh, in his uh, effort to get a vote in Congress to allow him to go to war in Syria. And then we have something else, which is there are lobbies in the U.S. that would like to see the U.S. use a military option in the case of Iran. And instead, we see now negotiations. And this, I think, is because the American people have been pushing for negotiations instead of war. This goes against some of the largest lobby groups, the military lobby groups, the Israel lobby groups in the United States. But it's a good sign of a shift in the American public. And when it comes to drones, we are starting to see a shift in the American public as well. When a poll was taken in February of 2012, it showed that 83% of Americans were in favor of using drones against terrorist suspects overseas. And you know a suspect is somebody who has never been convicted of anything. I was shocked when I saw uh, that percentage. If you look today at the polls, they show about 60%. This is a very significant drop in public opinion. And we are working hard to get to the day when the majority of Americans will say no to the use of drones. And this, as you can imagine, is in a larger context where we want the American people to say, in general, no to war. And I want to, um, to end with a, a story uh, on our visit to Pakistan because it was quite remarkable when Code Pink put out a call saying we want to go visit with people in the tribal areas who have been the victims of our policy. Uh, you can imagine uh, getting an invitation where we said uh, you have to pay your own way we cannot guarantee your safety we are going into a very dangerous area. Well, I saw, thought maybe we would get three or four people who wanted to go. We had to cut it off when we had uh, 34 people who insisted on joining us. Um, and we got to Pakistan. We were all sitting in a room, and I asked them, how many of you had a loved one who said, please don't go on this trip? And everybody raised their hand. Um, the, the ambassador from the U.S. in Pakistan came to visit us on our first day and said, you shouldn't be here. There is tremendous anti-American sentiment in Pakistan. <laughs> and we said, we know because of your policies. Um, and uh, he told us not to travel. Uh, and we uh, disregarded the advice. We traveled in, in Islamabad, in the capital. We did protests. Uh, and then we were going to take a dangerous trip to go to the tribal areas. 
Well, the day we were leaving, he sent his security people from the embassy, and uh, the security um, uh, representative said, we have credible evidence that the Taliban, they have seen you in the newspapers while you're here, they've seen you in the television, they know you are coming, and they are going to strap explosives to donkeys and camels and kill you. Well, we looked at each other and we said, um, that sounds troubling, let's discuss this. Uh, I felt responsible for having brought the whole group and I said to the group, we don't have to take this risk. We have already had many meetings. We've already met with drone victims in the capital, Islamabad. We've already been on the press. There is no reason to take this risk. And the entire group said, we have come this far. We want to go to the places where the drones are killing people because we want to show that there are Americans against these policies. And while we have the luxury of deciding whether to put ourselves at risk or not, the people in that region do not have the luxury. So we got on the buses, we went up, hours and hours of driving, uh, spent the worst night of my life where I could not sleep the whole night thinking, what did I do? Why did I bring these people here? Uh, and the next day we had a big rally uh, with local people and we were asked to come on the stage and address people. So it was a sea of tribes people, uh, just about all of them men. Our group was almost all women. Uh, and we got out to the stage and we heard yelling. And I thought, uh-oh, what are they yelling? Uh, I thought maybe they were saying, Americans go home. All of us were looking out in the crowd to see if we could find a donkey or a camel. <laughs> Uh, and instead, what we heard they were yelling was, welcome, 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 we want peace, we want peace. Uh, there wasn't a dry eye among our group. We got a chance uh, through the translators, and my translator was uh, Imran Khan, the most uh, uh, popular person in, in Pakistan. And as we would say something about how we were Americans who came all this way to tell them that we thought that their lives were as important as our lives, that when we saw a list of 200 children who had been killed, we feel that those children are as precious as our own children, that we feel that this policy is a policy of murder, it's a policy that is immoral, and we will do everything when we go back home to stop it. And we had just the amazing support uh, from people in that rally. And I think it showed to us how important it is for us as citizens to model uh, the kind of behavior we want in our country, our country and our government. And it shows that not just the American people, but the Pakistani people, the Yemeni people, the Afghan people, um, we all are tired of war. We all want to move to a different phase. That phase has to include peace negotiations. I might not like, and I certainly do not like what the Taliban stand for, but after 10 years of fighting, there has to be negotiations. I don't want my government to keep recruiting Al-Qaeda. I want local people to be fighting Al-Qaeda because they know that that's Al-Qaeda is not the society that they want. But it really is time, I think, for the U.S. people to join hands with you in Germany, people throughout Europe, and people especially in the places where we are using these weapons to say uh, that we want to live together in peace, that we want to put our resources as a global community not into developing more and more lethal uh, and robotic kinds of warfare, uh, but to alleviate poverty, to fight global warming, uh, to uh, provide for health care for people throughout the world, uh, for things that people really need in their lives. So I end on the note of saying that I appreciate so much uh, the uh, work of the left party in Germany, uh, the work of people like you here in this room, 
uh, and that I hope when I come back someday to Germany that I can hold my head up and be, be very proud that we have moved not only from the years of George Bush uh, into the years of a democratic administration, but no matter who is in the White House or who is in Congress, we as the people were able to force our government to have a policy that gets us off of the treadmill of endless war and on to a new era of global peace. Thank you. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's, a, it, it's a, just a, an example of um, uh, both the militarization in our society and how we can stand up uh, against it. And that was, uh, I was telling about getting on a plane recently in the United States, going from one city to another, and the airline actually said, uh, whoever is here from the military, please uh, step forward. Uh, we want to thank you for your service, and everybody clap for them, and please, we want you to get, be the first to be able to go on the plane. Um, this is before women with children. This is before elderly people. You know, put the military on first, and everybody is, is dutifully clapping for the military. And I'm thinking of uh, Iraq and how devastated it is. I'm thinking of what we have done in, in, in uh, Afghanistan. I'm thinking of uh, all the abuses of, of the military. And I'm, I'm thinking of how sad it is that um, we have this kind of glorification of the military. And so I couldn't sit quiet and I, and I got up and I said, are there any teachers in the room? And could you please stand up? We would like to thank you for your service and please go on the airplane first. <laughs> So on that anecdote, I think maybe we want to uh, end by saying it really is a question of how do we turn our societies from ones that are, uh, that uh, uh, have such a strong uh, military culture that uh, have put so much uh, money into the military. I mean, you as Germans know better than we do how you can move away from a military culture, and we, we ought to learn from you. But right now in the United States, uh, we have gutted our manufacturing se a sector. We barely produce anything anymore in the United States. And what we, one of the main things we do produce is weapons. And when you produce a lot of weapons, uh, it becomes a jobs program. And you find that people in Congress, uh, in every single district, they are manufacturing weapons. And so these Congress people vote for more weapons because they are voting for jobs in their district. And of course, they're also voting for more money for their elections because these are the very companies that contribute to their uh, election campaigns. So it's a very corrupt system. And uh, it needs a major overhaul in what we produce how we produce it, who benefits, and what do we benefit from. And I, I like to end on hopeful notes because uh, while um, I, I think there is something to be said about pessimism of the intellect, we really need uh, optimism of the heart. And uh, if we are going to get up every day and fight this huge uh, military uh, industrial surveillance complex, uh, it has to be with a, a sense of hope. And uh, my hope is that I am seeing f in the beginnings in the United States of a young generation that has not been uh, active in terms of coming out to demonstrations, uh, not wanting to do some of the traditional things that we've been doing to stop war, but are opting out of the system, uh, are going back to the land, going back to organic agriculture, going back to a, um, an economy that is separate from the corporate economy, uh, the hacker community is really quite a remarkable community that wants to uh, 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 bring down some of the worst elements of the, the surveillance state. Uh, and so there is, a, a, I think, a lot of, um, uh, of hope in a, a new generation that is not inculcated with this sense of uh, how great the military is. Uh, in fact, one of the, the 
uh, silver linings of this movement toward drones is that it's less and less uh, people who are actually involved in the military. There are fewer and fewer people who are joining the military. It's less than 1% of the population who has any direct connection uh, with the military anymore. And in the end, I think that will prove to be a positive thing in the U.S., so thank you for the work that so many of you have done to take a culture of, uh, a horrendous culture of militarism in Germany and uh, turn that around. And I look forward to getting more ideas from you about how we can do it in the United States. Thank you.